So, let's take a look at this first one. So, uh, big idea number two is structure and properties of matter. And let's see what that kind of entails. And, and the, I know that some of us, and I am too sometimes frustrated how I maybe have these things set up. I still haven't found the perfect way of reviewing. Um, I do feel like it's getting better because at least we're honing in on the big ideas and seeing how they're connecting in problems. But um, they're always going to throw monkey wrenches in there anyway. So they give us an equation. It says methane gas reacts with chlorine gas to form dichloromethane and hydrogen chloride as represented in the equation above. A. 25 gram sample of methane gas is placed in a vessel react, uh, reaction vessel containing 2.58 moles of chlorine. I identify the limiting reactant when the methane and chlorine gas are combined. Justify your answer. Okay, so. We need to figure out the limiting reactant. So they gave us, I mean, there's not a lot here. They gave us that, and they gave us that, right? If I was doing a test, I would have actually written that there. So, um, I'd like you to figure that out any way you figure it out. There are, there's not one right way to do that. Apologies. Let's talk about that for a second. The fact that they gave us moles, what's the smart, faster, what, what's the faster way to do this? If I convert CH4 to moles, and then figure out how many moles of Cl2 I would need, I automatically can compare it to the Cl2 moles that I have, right? Making this up. If I convert this to moles of Cl2 and say I have three moles of Cl2, I need three moles, I don't have enough, right? So that means Cl2 is limiting. If I find out that Cl2, I need 2.5 moles, and I look, and it's 2.58, I have more than I need. So then the other one's limiting. So the fact that they gave us moles and grams, you should use the grams to find out how much you actually would need of the mole. So try that, please. Okay. So uh, again, some of you might have gone ahead and worked on this stuff before, but this is what I would have done. that mean? Right, because I need that much. I only have 2.58. Please, but you got to make sure you answer it. So uh, you need to say needed. Um, thus, <laughs> Cl2 is the limiting reactant. If you felt like you needed more, I would have just said uh, needed 3.12, only have 2.58. Um, how many points do you think that is? Two. I would have hoped so. Tell me more. I would have hoped. We're going to go through our points in the next day, two days now with our final. I, I've only graded a few again. It's amazing when I guess. I, I'm right 80% of the time, but the ones that I'm not, I'm always shocked at. I'm like, really? Like, you're giving two for that? Or that's only one? That's usually how I react to that. Um, most of the time, it's pretty obvious. Once in a while, um, it's not. This one, it doesn't shock me. I just, I thought it would have been more, whoops, double I. Uh, calculate the total number of moles of CH2Cl2 in the container after the limiting reactant has totally been consumed. So, what do you, what's the important part on this? You have to use CL2. I have to use this, right? I got to use that. So, please pick it up from there. So, like, I don't get what they're, they're phrasing. Um, it's always good to just go back to stoichiometry and make sure we can do this. It's, it's not a good feeling when you work on advanced stuff all the time and then they ask you something you're like, I know I really was good at this, but I don't remember now. That's not a great feeling. So now I just go from one to the other. I'm going two moles, one mole. Uh, okay, what am I looking for? Oh, just moles though, right? Oh, so my fault. So I just divide that in half. Okay, so 1.29. Uh, that's all. I'm going to guess that's only one point in it. 
The other one was one that sure as heck is only going to be one. Okay. What I like about this problem is it has a lot of different stuff in it. That's why I chose this one uh, for you. Initiating uh, most reactions involving chlorine gas involves breaking Cl Cl bonds, which has a bond energy of 242 kilojoules per mole. B. Calculate the amount of energy in joules needed to break a single Cl bond. Okay. So, most people are going to get this wrong. And the reason why is you're not understanding, and this is why I wanted to, um, this is one of the two reasons I wanted this thing here down here with the mechanisms, and actually this. This is actually why I had this. You might just want to even just physically do this so maybe you would remember this one day, like when you do this. When they give you an amount of energy, and then they say a single bond, you're like, uh, 242, There's, it's never that easy, right? It cannot be that easy. It couldn't be. This is the amount of energy it takes to break a mole of bonds. I need to figure out how, what the energy of one bond is. Okay, so what I would still do is start with what I know. Okay, so I have, um, and honestly, it does, you don't have to do it this way, but I'm going to do it this way, or else it's going to get a really small number. You could have totally left that number as is, but I'm going to do this. I'm just, I'm seeing the future on this, and I know that um, the number's going to get really small on you, so I might as well start with a large number, because I don't think it asks for, oh wait, actually, I need to do this, sorry, right, in joules, so 242,000 joules, now, story, uh, T charts, those of you, we don't do this enough, it's so weird, but when you ask for it out of stoichiometry terms, it's all of a sudden Avogadro's number gets really tricky, if this is here, and I want to get rid of it. I want to keep this, so I don't want joules ever, right? So I want it per a bond. So if I say one mole of bonds, how many bonds are in a mole? 6102 times 723, right? If I say how many donuts are in a dozen, you'd say 12. I mean, it's all the same. It's still this number. So what I would write is this. And then I would write actually bonds. Because now it's joules per bond. That's it. So it's ever asking for a single photon, a single bond, you probably have to divide by Avogadro's number. And they gave it to you per mole. I guarantee that most people, when they took this test on this problem, probably didn't get this right. Just because it, 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 it it's just a little bit out of uh, whack. I have, unfortunately, I think a lot of people probably wrote down uh, the exact same number as before. You know, that's not a that's not a huge leap. Actually, I feel really good about that. Why? When we talk about energies, like on um, a wave spectrum, almost every color, every wave is times 10 to the negative 19. So that's actually in a realm of, of size that we talked about. Take it or leave it. But regardless, one point. So you can't let that stress you out, right? I keep talking about being resilient. You got to just, you got to just fight for it and be okay if, if that one isn't going to work because you have confidence that other things are coming down the pipeline that you're going to be good at. Calculate the longest, oh, that's funny. I'm a wavelength. Calculate the longest wavelength of light in meters that can supply the energy per photon necessary to break the Cl2 bond. So if you would look at, now there's a couple ways you can do this, but if you would look at your orange sheets, which I don't, I'm not asking you to do that right now, I believe that they give you two equations. They give you this equation, okay, and then they give you this equation. I don't know if it's in that order. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it might be. That's all I'm wondering. Though. So right now we have that, right? And we're asking for, which is the lambda one, right? Just so you know, if you combine those together, I just want to do it once. You can do this. Those are the two equations together because this quick little education for you is if I plug that in there, that equals that. Right. Take out the the new, which is actually looks like a B, and say that's that, that's that. So I'm going to do this one. So all these numbers are on your orange sheet. This is Planck's constant. This is the speed of light. I don't think this is exactly the number that they give you. I think it's like 2.99. And then here's the, the oh, I'm, whoops. So what did I mess up? It's okay, because it's still the same setup. These would switch, right? If you were doing algebra, those can switch. 
down above and below. Um, did you work at Hypatia here? Or did you say? Uh, I get a wavelength, um, and my answer, you guys, it. I'm just gonna write the answer down. I want to talk about again why I'm feeling good. It says wavelength of light. Now I don't, I don't know if that's visible light. That doesn't say that, but there are a couple things that I just feel always good about. If you ever, I want to write it down. I want you to write this in a corner somewhere. If you see frequency, I think that's right. Can someone just take this number and divide it by that number one? Wait, wait, wait. Now take this number, sorry, and divide by that number. This number divided by that number. I just want to hear the 14. I've done this long enough that every problem, it, it, confidence is a big deal, right? Like when you get an answer, if you're like, hey, that makes sense. That's in a range. That's something I recognize. If you get a frequency that's in the 14s, that's probably on the electromagnetic spectrum. That's making sense. If you get a wavelength between negative 12, which is x-ray, to about infrared, that's making sense. Colors are always negative 7. Colors are always negative 7, so that's the big one. And then energies are usually in the negative 19. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong if it's negative 20 or negative 18, but I'm just saying, when I got that answer, man, did I feel good. When I got that answer, I felt really good. I've seen it enough. Bless you. The thing is, you've done enough problems that I think you can try to remember that. Frequency, oh, why isn't that negative? Because frequency is how often a wave hits in a second. It would make sense that there's a lot of them. It's not like, oh, hey, there's one every third moon. You know, like, that's not how it works. Okay, it, it's going to be uh, very, very, very frequent. So the frequency is a big number. Everything else is a tiny number. So um, anyway, just, just a sidebar, but I think that's kind of important. Check it out. One point is earned for the correct set of consistent parts B that you're... So either you use these two, or the, sorry, I was just read, or they said if you use this one, you get a point. So if you recognize that you're using these equations, so either you go in step by step, finding the frequency, putting the frequency, finding the wavelength, great. If you tried to find that, that's awesome. Apparently, even if you do it wrong, if you're using them, you get a point. One point is earned for the correct answer. Okay. Um, then they say the following mechanism has been proposed. So it's two points. For the reaction of methane gas with chlorine gas, all the species in the gas phase. Okay, so I see a fast equilibrium, slow, fast, fast. D, in the mechanism, is CH3Cl a catalyst or is it an inter intermediate? Justify your answer. Okay, so I'm looking for. Is that right? Both same? So, catalyst or intermediate? Intermediate. And you have to justify. Please don't get wordy. It's an intermediate because it was produced, then consumed. That's all I'd say. How would I say it for catalyst? And then it yeah, it's introduced, then consumed. So you gotta use the word introduced for catalyst. For a intermediate, you gotta say it was produced, right? It was actually created. You didn't bring it into the party. It just morphed into there, like right? It, it, it occurred after the fact. We didn't have control over it in the beginning. So that, that's it. Does order matter? Yeah. If you do step four before step three, that becomes a catalyst. But that's not the way that this mechanism works. So clearly an intermediate. You got to know it, though. I mean, that's one of those either you know it or you don't. And it does say justify. I guarantee, I, I'm just going to assume it's a point. That's two points I'm going to be floored. That was enough. Um, e, uh, identify the order of the reaction with respect to each of the following according to the mechanism in e each case. Okay, there's one part of here that's going to be, I believe, a little tricky, which we will talk on slightly. Okay, so identify the order in terms of each case. So first we have the methane. So it's only in terms of each of those. Well, which one is the one that matters? 
the slow step, right? So it's a thing called, you don't have to come up with this word, but it does help if you do, if you have to explain it, molecularity. What it means is molecules collide. And that is truly that the heart of chemistry. I always talk about it in, with our, in like human relationships. Online or whatever, you still have to make an interaction. You have to meet. Like you're not just going to all of a sudden, oh yeah, I'm married. Who is she? I don't know. But I'm married. You don't need to know someone. We don't need to talk. We never need to talk. We never talk. No interaction. But we're married. I got a piece of paper. Uh, you got to have some interaction at some point. Of course, you wouldn't have the chemistry. So that makes no sense. So there's only one of these. So I'd say it's first order. Now, just to confirm this, by the way, you guys, here's the real key. See how there's one here and there's still only one there? That's the ultimate, uh, like, that'll really push you into saying that's first order. So that's first order. Is it first order because there's only one? There's only one CH4 in the slowest step, CH4 molecule. Had this before. I don't. I haven't seen them do this since. This is the last time I've seen this. I'm not saying that they can't do this again. But if you say Cl2, and if you've already looked at the answer, just hold tight. And you look here and you go, oh, that's not Cl2. That's Cl, right? That's a problem. Then you look on here, and there is a Cl2. Now it's really confusing. So you have to go based off of the um, the mechanism, though. So, what is this compared to Cl2? Just math, like half of it. That's, that's the order. You're like, we can do that? When you're talking specific little ones, apparently, they're just trying to see if you can, you can, this is one of those, hey, welcome to the thing you've never learned. Okay? There will always be something like that. Okay, so. What it is, the, the order for the reaction with respect to Cl2 is one half. Substituting the rate loss of step two, the slowest step. Um, uh, because the exponent of Cl2 and the rate law is half, the order of the reaction with respect to the Cl2 is half. I'm, I'm skipping a couple things of what I'm saying because basically we they want Cl2, but you're only given Cl. So it has to relate, though, to relate. So that's bringing half of that. So that's how I would justify it, I'm trying to stay away from the, the math that they're showing here. Um, but that's just the way it would work. Oh, if you want to really see it, I'll just show you this. If you want to see. I'm not ex asking you to do this, though. What they're saying is, hey, in the problem, I have Cl2. But we have two of them, so if you do a little bit of math with that, uh, that's how you would get to CL. Uh, that means that the math of it would actually be a half. I would just justify this. In the reaction, CL2 is a reactant. However, in the rate determining step, there's only CL, so that would be um, half of my reactant, and thus would be half of the quantity, or half of the order, however you want to view it. It's like, what's first order? First order is if I double something, I double something else. So if all of a sudden you have half of your compound, whenever you double it, it's, it's not going to have the full effect. It's only going to have half the effect. So it's only a half. It is what it is. It's only a point. Again, you got to realize that, like, hey, it's probably only a point. So let's get to one more, and then we're going to just start looking at our final. Um, I cannot record that legally, so I'm going to stop that at that point. Um, all right, so... Okay, don't ever get confused if it talks about certain things. They keep changing how the test is scored. Don't let that affect you. One long time ago, they used to let you choose. Answer one or two. Answer seven or eight. But they also had equations, and you had to like memorize 180 different equations in the middle of the test. So that was a positive that they had. Here you go. Process. Br2 to Br2, but liquid to gas. Solid to gas. 
At 298 and 180, the standard state of bromine is a liquid, whereas the standard state of I2 is a solid. The enthalpy changes for the formation of Br2 and I2 form from these elemental forms at 298 and 1ATM are given in the table above. A. Explain why the change of H for the formation of I2 from I2 solid, uh, from gas to solid, is larger than the formation of Br2 from gas to liquid. In your explanation, identify the type of particle interactions involved and the reason for the difference in the magnitude. Wow, there's a lot there. So because there's a lot there, it's probably going to be multiple points. So it's making sure that you talk about the interactions so you need to talk about those. So basically what I'm doing is I'm saying this. Um, okay, I'm going from a liquid to a gas. And this one I'm going from a solid to a gas. And clearly that one's a lot bigger. Well, right there, I mean, just the idea of going from a solid to a gas or to a liquid to gas, that's like two steps, right? That's two phases versus one. So I got to make a bigger leap. Uh, it's asking identify the types of interactions. What are the interactions when you're talking about these? Anybody know? So when I'm going from here to here, it's, it's nothing. I'm not interacting with anybody else but itself. But I'm doing IMFs. Like how did I, how would you know that? Phase changes. Phase changes are like boiling points and freezing points and things like that. So they both have LD. They're both London. So both. LD is fine. Okay, I'm just making sure I'm answering the question right. Okay, so there's two things you could talk about with this. First, if you're just talking about, um, the, the problem is you're talking about two different phase changes. But even if you weren't, if this is larger, what does that mean? If there's more energy involved, that means that it has a higher IMF. If they're both LDs, what makes an LD stronger? The electron cloud, the size of the cloud. Some people will read uh, an answer key and say polarizable uh, cloud. It just means the charge of it. So um, I would say this. This is how I would start. I2 I2 has a greater IMF due to the electron cloud being larger than that of Br2. I'm going to just read the rest of what they have. Um, you're probably good at that point. Uh, you could also say that the last thing you could say, I think it would make a lot of sense, is that the I2 is having to uh, phase change from a solid all the way to a gas, which means it actually has to uh, overcome heat of fusion and Vaporization. If you don't remember fusion, that means going from a solid to a liquid. Here, you're just overcoming vaporization. So you have a longer road. Uh, let me read it. Two reasons may be given. The first reason is that London dispersion forces, the only intermolecular forces involved for both these nonpolar molecules, will be stronger than I2 because of its greater number of electrons and larger size. The second reason is that since H of sublimation is approximately H fusion plus H vaporization, I2 should have a larger H of formation since it involves sublimation, whereas Br2 formation involves only vaporization. One point is earned for identifying London dispersion forces. One point is earned for either of the following. Explaining the reason for the greater LDFs in I2 or stating that the entropy change from solid to gas is greater than the entropy change from liquid to gas. So your brain should have went somewhere there. So you could have said LD, and then hopefully, I think the easier one is just saying, hey, larger the cloud, stronger the LD for that. Otherwise, you could have just said it's a greater trip. It takes more energy to go from a solid to a gas than from a liquid to a gas. I think that's fine, too. So that's two points. Here we go. Uh, letter B. And they're all really important to review over. Predict which of the two processes shown in the table has a greater change in entropy. Justify your answer. So entropy is disorder, right? So which one has a greater entropy change? So I want this. What's the answer? I2, because aren't I going from solid, which is very organized, right, to 
to a gas versus a liquid to a gas. That's all you have to say, right? You don't have to know anything else about it. So the I2, is it going from a solid to a gas versus Br2, which is a liquid to a gas. Now, if I were doing a test, I would probably actually state that solid is organized versus gas is very disorganized. This uh, organized, I mean, you what they have. I2 solid to gas should have the greater change in entropy. The sublimation of I2 may be thought of as a combination of fusion and vaporization. This conversion from solid to liquid may involve an increase in entropy, as would be given the conversion. Jeez, okay, they're not. Mm -hmm. From liquid to gas is only undergoing the liquid to gas conversion and still will undergo a smaller entropy increase. I feel sure these are much more educated chemists than me, but I feel like they're missing the main point. Isn't uh, entropy above disorder? So entropy, you should be talking about the packed elements in the compound, or the atoms, and uh, solid is, is very highly organized. Gases are extremely unorganized. So you have a greater change. That's, that's the heart of it. But I don't have a PhD, so. I2 solid and Br2 liquid can react to form the compound IBr liquid. Predict which would have the greater molar enthalpy of vaporization. By the way, if we keep hearing this, vaporization, enthalpy of vaporization, like if when we did this thing, the heating curve, and you had a solid, a liquid, and a gas, the phase change, this is the heat of fusion. What it means is you're changing from a solid to a liquid. This is a vaporization. Vaporization is always easier to know because it sounds like it, right? Oh, something vaporized that went from a liquid to a gas. Fusion doesn't quite sound like that. So if you ever hear those things, all it is is phase changing from liquid to solid or vice versa. You can go either way. And from liquid to gas or technically vice versa. And I know you're like, well, isn't that condensation? I understand that, but that's just what it's phrased as. Uh, direction is fine. I know you guys are all, I feel, I feel the tiredness from you. Sorry. Um... So predict which would have the greater enthalpy of vaporization. So um, I, this is what I'm being asked. So which one would have a greater enthalpy of vaporization? So basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to overcome it. What, what does that mean? I'm trying to become, just trying to show you some visuals here. If you don't understand the question, that's the question. Which one would take more energy to go from a liquid to a gas? Guys, any phase change can be thought of as an IMF problem. If I'm phase changing, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to overcome it. These two water molecules are together. I want to boil. I need to separate them. It's just that simple. So I need to overcome it. It's like that stickiness. So which one would have a greater IMF? IBR, because it's probably polar. Well, how do you know that? Because they're different, right? This one looks like this. This one looks like this. It's probably polar. If you had to predict, it's probably like this. Because BR is closer to the upper right. So this is polar, meaning that you have dipole, dipole. This is nonpolar, meaning you have LD. If you didn't know the IBR core, could you say it's bigger than the BR2? If, if that's the case, yes. It, or if you, yeah, I mean, technically, technically, if you don't know the electroneg uh, the electronegativity, maybe that bond isn't enough to be polar, right? So you're still right, because it is larger. It is larger. Yep. So you still could say, I will say this, if you're unsure, then try not to label it and just say it has a stronger IMF, because it's larger, or something like that. If, if you're really trying to be delicate. IBR, two reasons can be given. First, IBR is polar and dipole-dipole forces would be uh, would tend to increase the enthalpy of vaporization. Second, IBR should have stronger London dispersion forces because of the greater number of electrons in the larger IBR molecule. Both work. And that's true. We still have London, right? They all have London. So if you're unsure, well, you know what? It's not going to be that great of a polarity. It also has a stronger London force. So what I would say is that if I was writing it fully, I'd say that these, this has a larger, uh, stronger IMF, which causes it to, uh, or would require more energy to uh, go from a liquid to a gas, or overcome those IMFs, or something like that. More energy needed to overcome the IMFs. Something along that pathway, and that's great.
amazing how many questions can deal with IMS. Now, I know we're kind of in that chapter with that big idea, but it is amazing. Uh, two left, and we are done. A uh, big new reset. An experiment is performed to compare the solubilities of I2 with different solvents, water, and hexane. A student adds two mils of water and two mils of hexane to a test tube because water and and hexane are immiscible. What does that mean? They don't mix, right? Okay. If it was a solid and a liquid, they'd say they're insoluble. The liquids are immiscible. Two layers are observed in the test tube. The student drops a small purple crystal of I2 into the test tube, which is then corked Inverted several times, meaning shaken. The, uh, the hexane layer becomes light purple, while the H2O layer remains virtually colorless. D, explain why the hexane layer is light purple, while the water layer is virtually colorless. Your explanation should refer to the relative strengths of interaction between molecules of I2 and the solvents of water in C6H4 and the reasons for the differences. This is what throws you off. You probably were all ready to go if you were on this test. And if you're dozing off, please give me... 20 more minutes, 15 more minutes, and you're good. Um, but then they give you that. You guys got to understand, if water is going to dissolve something, it needs to interact. Okay, so like dissolves like. Polar dissolves polar. Non-polar dissolves non-polar. So if you can't interact, you if it's being asked about will it dissolve in water, you literally have to say, it will dissolve in water, water because there's high interactions between the... Um, the ions and the water. In this case, there are no interactions between the I2 and the H bonding in water because I2 is nonpolar and water is very polar. So that's why it won't interact. So that's why it's going to interact. Um, well, it really doesn't. Nonpolar things don't interact. They all just kind of float around and don't care. Like they don't even say hello. They just kind of. So they're all mixing together, and because of that, they actually can mix. Water is going to like not let you in. Like, nope, you're not in. You don't have the secret uh, knock or password. So um, that's that's why. We, so so this is polar. Water's polar. Hexane's very nonpolar. Um, the hexane layer is purple because most of the I2 is dissolved in it. The entrance of the I2 in water requires disruption of the hydrogen bonds in water, which are much stronger than the LD forces. Meanwhile, the London dispersion forces between I2 and hexane would be stronger. Then the London dispersion forces between I2 and water. Water and I2 can also interact through a dipole induced dipole force, but this attraction is insufficient to overcome. So basically, what you could say is that the I2 LDs interact with LDs from the hexane, not the H bonds from the water. How I would finish it. What they're trying to get you to do is just literally, you got to just suck it up and don't get lazy right there. I need to just say everything. What does each thing have as an IMF? Okay. Uh, hexane is an LD, not polar. I2 is a nonpolar LD. Water is a highly polar H bond. And then just say, well, these don't interact. These do interact. And I know you're like, but it's so obvious. Great. Slam dunk at home. Um, and finish it. You get two points. One point is earned for recognizing from the experimental observations that the iodine dissolved in the hexane. Okay. I guess. Said that the hexane was purple, and they said the I was purple. So I hope that we would think that it's in the hexane. But yay. One point is earned for the correct explanation referring to the differences between water and hexane in their interactions. All right, final two letters, and we are done, but or, uh, for I and double I. Um, the student then adds a small crystal of Ki into the test tube. The test tube is corked and inverted several times. The I minus ion reacts with the I2 to form the I3 minus ion, a linear species. I, in the box below, draw the complete Lewis electron dot diagram for I3 minus. Okay, so it said it's linear. So it's got to be that, right? But it says the Lewis dot structure. I'm going to give you, we're not going to get as much on our test as I wanted, but that's okay. I'm going to give you a minute to draw this. These are points you cannot lose, but I want to see if you can do it. By the way, I'm going to give you even an extra hint. When you have charges, you need brackets with a negative. I'm going to be rude and cut you off halfway through. What do I assume first? They're all single bonds. 
Assume single bonds and octets, right? You feel like I don't know what to do next. I'm I'm trying to keep my mouth shut. Lewis electron dot diagrams, when we do it in the actual chapter, you're all superstars. You, you leave it for a half a year, and you forget the simple rules. Every one of you could do this a different way. I'm going to do TV. I'm going to do that. Simple truth is, my picture better reflect the number of dots that there should be, period. So I assume this first, because it gives me structure and does most of the work. But how many should I have? Three times seven, 21 plus one is 22. I go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So I need two more, and they always go in the middle, right? They always go in the middle. That's how it looks. What if it was short? What if it was the other way? That I drew 20, but I only needed 18. What, what does that mean? I need a double bond somewhere. What I would suggest then is you put the bond, like I would erase dots, and then you put the bond, and then what do you do? Complete octets. Then I go two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. That would be the trick on that. Don't just put a bond and go, ah, I don't know whether to erase now. Erase them all, and then just quickly go back through. Okay, final, final problem. And I'm going to assume it's a point. That was just a point. In which layer, water or hexane, would the concentration of I3 minus be higher? So, this is tricky. Because this alone is actually a nonpolar linear. But, it carries a charge. So let me ask you this. If this is a charge that's called an ion, right? Anybody remember the interactions between an ion and something that's polar? Something that's polar, something polar has a, no, it, well, actually, it could have covalent or an ion, but this is an ion, and water, for example, has a dipole. They're seeing if you remember this. It's asking for the specific, well, they're not, but I'm going to tell you. If you can hit this, it's great. I, I guess you don't need this, technically, sorry. I thought it asked her what is the exact interaction. Um, first off, it would be in the water because of the ion. They're, they're seeing, they're trying to trick you. Well, it's not polar. They're forgetting about the charge. Anything with a charge will dissolve usually, well, not anything, but um, in this case, it's going to dissolve in the water. It's an ion dipole technically interaction. But you could say that uh, ions dissolve in polar substances. Something like that. Ion, uh, I3 minus would be more soluble in water because the ion dipole interactions that would occur between the ions and the polar water molecule. No such interactions are possible with nonpolar hexane. The problem is, we've learned things are also non, I mean, there's KSPs of things that are ionic. So you don't know the exact wording on that. So that's why, though. That's only a point. Okay, so that concludes our uh, big idea number two. We don't have any left in there. If you have more left in there, I'll tell you now, blank things are not okay. Um, even if they didn't get stamped, I will say that at some point it should be filled in. When you hand in the big packet, it's worth like 200 points, all of them, all six. That's a big homework. So at some point, just be heads up, heads up.